help me give Hakeem a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, Patrice. I uh, appreciate that introduction. Uh, and thank you all for having me. I'm excited to be here uh, in Livonia Schoolcraft College. I would like to acknowledge uh, the organizing planning team that uh, brought me here. Um, and all of you for receiving me and everyone that's supporting this college and in this, in this community. Um, I'm, very, I'm very excited to be here for a, a number of reasons, not only because it is an honor and celebrating of a great legacy of someone like Dr. King, uh, but the times in which we live in today call forth all of us to be and aspire to be as great as Dr. King. I think one of the peculiar things that Catrice pointed out, you know, or, or maybe to quote him pointed out, that Dr. King was not a um, superhero, right? He was not a super, he was just anyone among us who had a dream, right? And a dream is but a seed, you know, and a seed is temporary, right? A seed is a temporary thing that we plant in the ground, and once it begins to get what it needs of its water and the sustenance that bears its life, it ceases to be a seed. And that seed becomes a reality, becomes a tree. It gives birth. And that's what this focus is all about. It's about how do we, in our lives, give birth to the Dr. King in us? How do we become the seed that bears fruit and ultimately gives shade to everyone? So you heard a little bit about my story. So I want to kind of share a little bit about my story to kind of pivot to show you how someone like you like me, could come from that caterpillar stage of life and blossom into become a great butterfly that soars over the earth, right, that reaches the mountaintop and can now overlook and see what no one else can see and could then inspire people with that vision to say, look, I've been to the place where you all haven't been. I placed the wings on my back. I've gone through the cocoon stage. And when you know when you're trapped in a cocoon stage, it's kind of like you feel trapped that, you know, you're in a place in which your movement is restricted. But it's the most opportune time for you in that moment of transition. Because while you're in that cocoon stage, while you're in that trap stage, it is then there that you begin to realize who you are. That in fact, that you don't belong inside that caterpillar stage in that cocoon that in fact that in that cocoon stage that diversity that adversity i should say the challenges of life that we confront that in that cocoon that we are there to begin to blossom and realize who we truly can be because we're going to emerge from there as what a beautiful monarch butterfly with beautiful colors showing everyone who sees us greatness and beauty and the nature that we are the nature that we are made of so I want to start off by talking about a quote from Dr. King, and I want to use that as the basis for showing you how the, each one of us, my, like myself, were once a seed that blossomed to become a butterfly that soars over this earth. And the call of Dr. King, I think, is that for each and every one of us to contribute our seeds to the garden so that together we can build a beautiful, right, fluorescent garden that gives life and fruit, vegetables, sustenance to everyone. So Dr. King was famous for saying, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So whatever is happening to us here in our country in America, right here in this city, right here on this college campus, whatever is affecting us or impacting us directly is likewise going to have an impact on others in one way or another. And that becomes the basis from which Dr. King felt that he needed to stand up with his voice and represent others because if anyone was impacted by what was happening in America in the 1950s and the 1960s, the pinnacle of the civil rights era, if anyone was affected by it, then it needed to be known to the rest of the world that this is happening in America and it should not be happening. So he was able to step up and sacrifice himself to utilize his voice to plant that seed so that today we could have some fruit so that we can be bearing fruit and eating vegetables and fruit and sustenance to ourselves. So what does that mean for us? Well, for a young man like myself, growing up in the 80s there, 80s crack era, there was a time in which young black males in America were poised to be, unlike Dr. King's dream, in which he envisioned an opportunity for which people 
little black boys and little black girls could freely enjoy all the opportunities that this life had in store for us. This, the beautiful opportunities that democracy guarantees each and every one of us. His dream was to make sure that we would be able to see that and live in a time that no one would be discriminated against, that no one would be turned away for service, that no one would have to sit in the back of the bus, right? That no one would have to, for example, stand when a seat was available in the front, but because you were of a different complexion, you weren't allowed to take that seat. You had to go in the crowd and back and stand. He fought so that people like me, when the 80s arose, that I didn't have to experience the challenges that I experienced. So what were those challenges for young black males like myself that inspired me with the dream to, to, to never have to live under the conditions that I found myself under? So Dr. King's dream continues to function for me as a visionary path of what is possible for me. So young black males in the 80s were poised, were called uh, a generation uh, that was at risk. Uh, we were considered to be uh, an endangered species is some of the language that was used. Although an endangered species was considered to be an endangered animal out in the wilderness that its species evolution was threatened by perhaps what man was doing, right? How we were taking over the land of animals who lived and roamed freely in their habitat. We were declared, young black males were beginning to declare an endangered species because of what was happening socially, the social climate of the 80s. Young black men were frequently at risk of death or incarceration because of the sociological circumstances that had now arisen in urban America. And what were those circumstances? We have to understand that Dr. King, after his assassination in the late 60s, it was a time in which America was supposed to see the fruits of the labor of the sacrifice of Dr. King and so many before him. The civil rights era ushered in the opportunity to remove those discriminatory barriers to where African Americans and other peoples of color were not discriminated against and told that you could not eat here or you could not drink from this faucet. A very biased, discriminatory time in which economically Socially, academically, you know, educationally, health-wise, African Americans and people of color in this country were repeatedly behind, starting from the rear, trying to catch up to America, right? So young black males found themselves in the middle, in the mid-80s, without the opportunity to enjoy those freedoms that people had sacrificed and lost their lives for. So young black males like myself found ourselves up against great odds of incarceration. We no longer understood that education was the most important vehicle and instrument to get us to the places we needed to succeed. We didn't understand that because something had happened. Something had happened in the early 70s right after the civil rights era that we still had not calculated and come to grips with what policies and practices that America began to do to undermine civil rights progress. So we have to take into account that once laws were passed, civil rights laws were passed, there were still people in this country that still felt that people didn't deserve the right to have equal protection under the law. And so therefore, policies and practices were implemented all across the country, from federal law to state law. They began to implement biased practices and policies. For example, I'm going to give you a great example. We were young black males, and we were involved in, some of us were involved in illegal activities. We were selling crack cocaine on the streets of America, very familiar here in the Detroit area. Well, the circumstances of which crack cocaine impacted our community is a very nefarious, right, investigative circumstance that we need to understand why drugs were able to circulate and proliferate in communities. In communities that were strapped in poverty, whom, for a young black male whose parents generationally were discriminated against, not allowed opportunities to access to education, opportunities to access to equal uh, uh, access to health care, and etc., young black males like myself were poised to be disadvantaged from the opportunities that were available, and so we made terrible mistakes and began selling drugs as an opportunity and way to escape our condition. 
I myself fell victim to that. You heard about the story of BMF, Big Nietzsche from the Detroit area, who fell victim to that. And we began hurting and harming our own selves by participating in the crack epidemic. Well, as nefarious as it was for that condition to exist in our community, law enforcement did not know how to respond. Community mentors and educators, social scientists, no one knew how to respond to young black males responding to the, to the harsh conditions of poverty in their community, the lack of opportunity in which they began willingly participating in their own self-destruction. No one knew how to respond to that. And you know how law enforcement responded? Well, we know, you ever heard of what's called stop and frisk? Stop and frisk is when, under suspicion that perhaps you're a drug dealer, we can stop you and frisk you to see if you have drugs and illegal weapons on you. What that created was an unconstitutional situation in which people's rights to their privacy were violated. Right? Not that what was happening, that, that we needed to stop people from carrying drugs and selling drugs, that was essential. We had to figure out a way to do that. We just had to figure it out at that time. So it's the way in which we begin practicing policies that are discriminatory and biased that hurt our community. That the call for Dr. King's dream must become realized in people who've experienced that form of harm. So this is the reason why I work in our community today. I work with law enforcement to bridge that kind of gap so that we're no longer just bypassing law because we don't know how to respond. But in fact, we come together and say, let's figure this out. Let's come up with solutions. Together, the people, the community come together and come up with solutions to figure out how, in fact, we eradicate problems from our community without implementing policies and practices that are discriminatory. It has happened decade after decade that we have failed to find solutions to the most pressing problems that impact us. So let me put that in forefront with my own life story. So you heard a little bit about the fact that I am now a commissioner, that I have overcome great challenges in my life. Well, it wasn't easy to overcome those great challenges because as I fell victim to participate in the 80s crack era, in 1991, I decided for the first time in my life, at the age of 18, that I was ready to change my life. So I left the state of Michigan I went to the state of Wisconsin and went to Milwaukee, and I attempted to enroll in Job Corps. Job Corps told me, we would love to take you in and teach you a skilled trade that you can go on and produce a career with and live a life. However, at that time, I had a felony conviction at the age of 17 from carrying a firearm in Lansing. So they said that you can't come into our program until you have your GED. So I enrolled in Milwaukee Area Technical College to get my GED. Before I could complete those courses, I was arrested at a liquor store on the corner of 60th and Silver Spring in Milwaukee for a fight. Young kid, 18, myself, drinking, illegal, and I got into a fight. Once I got into custody, I was never ever asked, not once, about the fight I was in. I was only asked about an unsolved murder that happened three weeks prior to my arrest. An unsolved murder I had absolutely no knowledge about. Well, two other gentlemen were in custody with me at that liquor store, and they asked him the same question about the unsolved murder. None of us had any knowledge about that unsolved murder. Well, they began then playing an interrogation game, a tactic that is used to actually accuse people who perhaps might be guilty of something, accuse them, accuse them, uh, say they have evidence implicating them because if they actually are guilty, maybe they'll then admit that, yes, you have evidence against me, I'm guilty, I did it. Well, they had zero evidence against us, so they lied to us and said they had evidence against us to see if we would confess to a crime that we didn't commit. Long story short, young man by the name of Mark Henry, 19 years old, he believed law enforcement that, in fact, we had confessed and implicated him. In fact, we never confessed. We never implicated him. We didn't know anything about the crime. He then confessed because he believed that we had confessed and falsely implicated him. So he then began telling a false story to implicate us, to save himself from a crime he himself didn't do. Long story short, I was charged with first degree murder. I was convicted and I was sentenced to 45 years in prison. At the age of 18, I had to figure out at that moment if I was gonna dream awake or stay dreaming sleep. I decided to follow in the path and wake myself up to figure out why and how I had gotten myself in that predicament to where I was now sentenced to 45 
five years in prison for a crime I had not committed, but by poetic justice, a crime that for a young black male that I had become, I could have committed. So I had to figure out who, in fact, I had become, but who was I supposed to be? So it was then in that instance and moment that I began to focus on rebuilding me to find out who I supposed to be in life. So it was that, in that moment, in that condition, that I began my own rebirth to dream, to find a greater passion in life. It took 15 years for me to win my freedom. 17 years ago, in 2006, the Wisconsin Innocence Project was able to take my case to the Wisconsin Parole Chairman and say, hey, you have someone in prison who's innocent, who doesn't belong there. Presented them with the evidence. There was never any evidence to convict me to begin with. It was only an individual's testimony. But there were eyewitnesses at the scene who came to court and who even testified that I wasn't the one. Who even testified that they see the people, they can't point them out and, and, and they'll identify them. But nevertheless, we were still convicted. So the parole chairman agreed that I should not have been convicted and that I should be released. And in the injustice, in the justice of that injustice, I was granted parole. That was 17 years ago. Sadly, with our criminal justice system, it still hasn't reached fairness. So we still have a, a situation in which, let me tell you how fair this is to me. I'm going to ask you the question. Is it fair that, for example, a person like me, who has served 15 years of a crime they were innocent of, to be paroled by the parole chairman who believed that the individual is innocent, for that individual 17 years later to remain on parole. I stand here before you, a commissioner of the MIDC, gainfully employed, working in my community, awarded across this country, I still remain on parole. I still have a parole agent I must talk to and report to every single month, bro breathalyzer and urine in a cup. This is the epitome of our justice system today. And this is the reason why Dr. King fights, because we still have injustice happening in our communities. We still have policies and practices that should not be enacted. No one in the state of Wisconsin can give justification for why someone like me is remaining on parole. The state of Michigan has begged the state of Wisconsin to discharge my parole. It has not happened. Had a state senator named Getsky from the state of Wisconsin and went to the Wisconsin Department of Corrections and asked them, why would you not release this man from parole? He's been appointed by a governor in his home state. He's working in this community with all kinds of education, law enforcement, etc. Why would you not parole or release him from his parole? You know what they told him last year, before December? Will we visit after the election? So there's the politics involved, right? Because they were fearful that if they released me on parole, they will come back to harm the governor. We have to be courageous and get to a point in life to where we understand that justice cannot be stagnated because of someone's political affiliation, because of someone's career, because of someone's personal opportunity. But justice is something that must ring at the top. Justice is something that can't be compromised. We can't come to the table and try to figure out a compromise and say, okay, well, you've done good so far. Do good for five more years and then we'll let you off parole. Right? We, you can't compromise with justice and fairness. And so, there's a few things I want to highlight before I finish about civic engagement. Because it isn't only about our personal stories, our personal examples that give us inspiration for do what we do. Let's take it back to the foundation of this country. The United States as we know it was created through the Declaration of Independence in which a country who hadn't been a country at the time of people who were the subjects of another country, they felt that the injustices of the governance over their lives were not appropriate for them. And they felt that they had the right to then declare their independence from that. And in declaring their independence from Great Britain, they declared a revolution. It is only a revolution of the physical proportion because they did unfortunately go to a physical war, right? But fortunately because now we have a country. But what Dr. King represented in a fullness of civic engagement is the fact that at a point in time, we may have to stand up to our government and say, this isn't right. And Dr. King's approach was to do so in a non-violent way. And this is the call for us today to come together in dialogue, in conversation.
conversation than civil disobedience, right? Because we know what happens when we advocate for violence. So Dr. King understood that that wasn't going to get us to victory, right? So that we know that today we're a civil society of high standards, high morality, that we can come together and sit down through dialogue, through consensus, we can remove some of the systemic barriers, the generational barriers that harm us, that restrict people's freedoms and opportunity. And let's look back and think back to the Declaration of Independence. When Thomas Jefferson originally wrote the, the, the Declaration, he, he had other people to come and help him edit it behind it. But some of the most famous quotes that we know are the Declaration, right? It was edited because Thomas Jefferson originally talked about the unalienable rights. He described them as sacred and undeniable, right? Sacred and undeniable, connected it to the fact that when we think about sacred and holy, we think about something that absolutely cannot be violated, right? And today when we talk about the Declaration of Independence, when we talk about people having certain unalienable rights that absolutely cannot be violated, the pursuit of what? Life? Liberty and happiness. That those particular three things is the pinnacle of why Dr. King knew that he had to stand up and fight for America's dream. For that seed to be planted, right? For that Declaration of Independence to say we declare ourselves independent of injustice. We declare ourselves to be independent of harm to society. And we declare that we have the right to be free, to pursue happiness in this world. But how do we do that if we all are involved in planting that seed, in watering that seed, and in becoming a fruit of that branch of justice that Dr. King and so many others sacrificed their lives for? So that no one of our personal stories in itself becomes the pinnacle. But the story of justice, the story of the fight for justice, and all the people like you and like I, along that route of justice, that our stories become the story of justice, that our stories become the dream that we envision, that we can achieve in this world, in this life, through dialogue, through consensus, through education, through collective leadership, through collective voice. We're not always going to agree. Disagreement is good. It's healthy because it allows us to then examine ourselves, examine our thoughts, our views. When you think about the American Constitution, it was written by a lot of people who were involved in the slave trade. So how do we reconcile people believing that it's the human beings have the right, to, the inalienable right, the sacred right to be free, to pursue happiness, to pursue their lives. How do we justify that when we have a mindset that's contrary to that? So we have to now talk about our founding fathers and how visionary, how much of a visionary they were and how much of that in itself hasn't been realized, hasn't been fulfilled. Fulfillment now rests on us. The responsibility of their shortcomings now rests on us. It now rests on us to get it right. The last thing I want to mention <clears throat> Dr. King's dream, I want to put that in the acronym, the D R E A M. For me, determination and dedication really represents my passion for the work that I do, particularly with youth and education and juvenile justice. So Dr. King's D dream to me stands for determination. And the R will stand for realization, to really truly realize justice and equity and equality. And the E, of course, is equity. And equity, unlike equality, has a little varied tone to it. Equity means that we provide everyone with what they really need. Right? So, if you need more assistance than I, then I need to give you what you need. I 
don't need to give you the same thing I got because I may not need what you need. I may be tall enough to see over the fence and you may not be. Alright? So we need to talk about giving you what you need, but at the same time we need to talk about removing the fence to begin with. That's equity. The full conversation. And the A, of course, would be and, because it's very important that there's secondary things to go with other things. The last point is an African concept called Ma. Now, Ma is an African Egyptian ancient concept, and they even have a goddess called Ma, M A apostrophe A T. In, in Egyptian philosophy, Ma represents the totality of order, of justice, of truth, of fairness in this world. The Ma represents everything that we think the United States Constitution stands for, the Bill of Rights, everything that we understand, the power of what it gives us as citizens in this country to live free and be free. That's what Ma represents. So that dream is a determined dream, a realized dream, a dream of equity, and a dream of the totality of everything we really seek in life, of order, justice, fairness. This is what we dream to achieve. And so I thank you all for joining us as we continue to fight for this dream the last over 50 years. I'll be 50 this year. And the dream started long before me. And Dr. King's dream, in order for it to be realized, each and every one of us must begin to plant that seed so that we and our future can become the fruit and the vegetables that we all enjoy to provide shade for everyone. So thank you so much. Thank you.